Mike, I'm ready. When, oh, hey, we're live. Okay. Hi, Internet. Um, so uh, welcome again to another uh, Rust meetup. Tonight we're, we're talking about web-related things. Uh, so uh, very excited for this. Um, as always, thanks, Mozilla, for feeding us, providing us Mike to run the AV, and giving us this great space. So thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. So uh, tonight we have uh, Patrick uh, giving an update on Servo, uh, Sean Griffin, who actually is uh, flown in here to talk about diesel. So that's very exciting. And Alan uh, will be uh, remote. I think I actually have this order wrong. I think Sean goes last. Um, and uh, the last thing, uh, upcoming meetups. Uh, that the, the next one hasn't been fully announced yet. It's, oh, sorry, that's the wrong date. It's going to be the... Uh, March 22nd, it'll be Big Daddy themed, and already have April to May starting to line up. So if anyone has any interest in speaking about anything, uh, please file a ticket on that link at the bottom. Anyway, uh, on to Patrick. Thank you. Please give him a warm welcome. Okay, let's hope this works this time. Okay. Okay. Is, can everyone hear me? Okay. Good. Um, hi. So I'm Patrick Walton. Uh, I've been working on Rust for way too long, um, and I work on Servo now. Um, and I'd like to talk about a thing that we're building in Rust um, as part of the Servo project. And actually, just today landed in Servo Master, so it's actually uh, you can download it and try it out right now if you go to uh, or if you check out Servo and build it. And it's called Web Render. Um, and so in this talk, I'm going to start off by motivating Web Render um, and then talk about what it is, how it works, and then I'll have, I'll have some demos. Um, I'm, please feel free to stop me um, at, if you have any questions at any time. Uh, you know, I'd like this to be interactive. So um, the first question is, why or what is the problem that we're trying to solve with web render? Um, and there are a few observations. Um, so, so Servo started out as an attempt to build a parallel browser, um, and it still is an attempt to build a parallel browser. And but we need to think more broadly: why are we building a parallel browser? And the reason we're building a parallel browser engine is for performance. We want to use all of the hardware that's in the CPU and in the system as possible. Because right now, web browsers are doing a very bad job of actually using all the hardware. You know, uh, so here's a picture of a Haswell CPU. This is probably not to scale, um, but it makes, the, it makes the point anyway. Um, this is you know, Intel's uh, labeled uh, colorized photo. And uh, so existing browser engines basically use one core of the CPU. So, you know, they'll, they'll, use, they'll use this part over here. Or they use, you know, maybe this. And so that's obviously only a small fraction of the area available in the CPU. So for Servo, we wanted to actually use all of the CPUs, um, which gets you, you know, we're using quite a bit of, of the hardware. But so this was a CPU from a few years ago. Um, and there have been, I think, two new generations of CPU since then. One of them was Broadwell. Um, and you notice that things look quite a bit different, or a little different at this point. Um, you've got the same cores, about the same size. Uh, you have you know, some more cache. And, uh, but they got a process shrink, and now they have more uh, space. And they didn't add more cores. They, added, they took the graphics, which looked like this, and made it look like this. So inside the CPU is now a very large GPU. And now you look at the most recent, the Skylake CPU, and you've got the, the uh, GPU on an Intel CPU is about as big, if not bigger, than all of the other CPU cores. So CPUs in consumer devices, not necessarily necessarily true for servers, but for consumer devices, 
they have not been adding new CPUs for us to use. They've been adding GPU space for us to use. So in order to actually, so this is very interesting for Servo because you know when we started this project a few years ago, we said, okay, you know, CPUs are gonna be many core in the future. Um, they have kind of stopped at four for consumer devices, but they continue to get process shrinks and they take all that space and they add it to the GPU. So in order to, to actually do what we set out to do, which is to use all of the hardware in the machine, we need to actually go to the GPU. Um, we need to use that space as well as all the CPU space. So basically, th this is you know a summary of what I of what I said. Um, Intel isn't giving us new CPU cores to work with. ARM is a little different. They've been going to octa core, but you know they they are following a pretty similar trajectory. And CPU cores aren't getting much faster. You know we have not more. They, people say Moore's law is ending. Um, the you know the clock speeds are not increasing that much. Um, but I think people, you know, say Moore's law is ending. But I think that's not actually that's not necessarily true if you consider about the CPU and the GPU, because the GPU is advancing with every hardware revision. Newer Intel CPUs have Intel Iris, which is much much better than Intel HD, um, and that will hopefully continue into the future. And GPUs are everywhere now. You know, even the five dollar Raspberry Pi Zero that was announced last last year has twenty four gigaflops in a GPU. It's just unbelievable how much GPU space is in there, and web browsers hardly use any of it. So WebRender is a painting engine. We, it rasterizes web content. You know, it draws, it draws web pages. Um, and our goal, and because that's the most natural place for us to start to expand to use the GPU better. So you might ask, why not use an existing GPU rasterizer? There are several GPU-based vector graphics rasterizers. Um, that we could use for drawing web content using the GPU. Um, there's Google's, which is uh, Skia, and their GPU backend is called Ganesh. Um, Direct2D is Microsoft's offering from a few years ago, and we do use these in Firefox. Uh, Quartz and Core Graphics has been moving to OpenGL on the Mac side. Um, so they all use the GPU to varying degrees. Um, but what's interesting about these APIs, what actually unites all of these APIs, is that they all started... Direct2D is somewhat accepted, but it's still basically the same thing. Um, they started by taking an API that was designed for the CPU and tried to transparently migrate it to the GPU. And so if that's the API that you need, then that is a really then that is a great thing to do. For example, the HTML canvas is this, is basically exactly the core graphics API mapped into the web. So we can't change the API. So Skia would be a great thing to use there. But in particular, it's, it's what we call immediate mode. And, and I'll ex for those who don't know, I'll explain the difference in just a second. Um, this is not necessarily the, the best use of GPU resources. Um, so graphics APIs, for those who don't know, actually have two sort of are broadly categorized into two different categories, immediate mode and retain mode, where essentially immediate mode means you, sub, you submit the drawing commands and they immediately happen. So you know you, you say, I want to draw this rectangle, and the moment you execute th that command, the rectangle is on screen or in the buffer that you gave to it. Whereas retained mode is uh, you give it the entire scene at once. You give it everything that you're going to render, and then the API decides what order it's going to render it in. Um, and what makes WebRender different from these previous APIs, these previous APIs are all immediate mode APIs, and WebRender is a retained mode API. The reason here is that immediate mode doesn't map very well to the GPU unless you, the user of the immediate mode API, take care to structure the calls in a way that actually that the GPU is actually going to be very fast at rendering. Um, so, in particular, you have to you need to submit many objects at the same time and avoid state changes. And the ex when web browsers were written in the 90s, they did not uh, they did not were not structured to do this, and so they don't. Um, so. What we observed is that we at CSS actually gives us something very close to the optimum thing to submit to the GPU. So we designed a web rendering engine around the, uh, essentially around CSS and the DOM. Um, and it's interesting that this is not, this is something that GPU vendors actually notice, in particular NVIDIA with their NV, NV path rendering extension. Um, there's, this, there's this great paper uh, where, from SIGGRAPH Asia 2012 where um, a couple of people from NVIDIA actually uh, investigated vector rendering on the GPU and basically found that 
everyone was doing it in a very suboptimal way. Um, there's this great quote, and they say, uh, the API overheads for the existing vector graphics engines um, can it substantially limit the overall performance. These approaches are often GPU assisted rather than GPU accelerated. And I really like that term. Um, and they go, they go on to say, um, so today web browsers respecify paths every time a web page with path content is re-rendered. Um, so we believe a retain mode is more appropriate and efficient and that should, they should behave more like video games. Um, so so that, that's actually interesting. Uh, so we didn't actually see, I didn't actually see this paper when we started it, but it was very interesting that I found it later and I thought it was very interesting that um, not only have we found that uh, the existing vector graphics APIs are suboptimal, it, the GPU vendors actually found this and found this a few years ago. Um, so it's kind of nice to actually be uh, doing what they wanted us to do all along. Um, and of course, it's written in Rust, that's why I'm giving the talk here. Um, and why would we do it in Rust? Well, because first of all, we need really low level performance. We're basically writing a game engine. Um, it's because that's how GPUs are optimized. That's what GPUs are optimized for. Um, but we're writing something that is, of course, very security sensitive. It's a web browser is going to be exposed to untrusted content, not directly, but you know, content can be structured in a way that they can basically send us any commands that they want. So we need to be free of memory safety problems. Um, but just as important, we need to be multi-threaded. Modern game engines are all multi-threaded. That's GPUs are increasingly being optimized for multi-threaded use, like uh, with APIs like Vulkan that are uh, on the way. So we need to be multi-threaded from the start. And Rust was a great thing to uh, was a great tool for us to do that because we didn't have to worry about data races and all that stuff. Um, okay. So the uh, so as for what web, as now that I've motivated it, um, web render is. As I said, it's a specialized renderer for CSS. It uses uh, it uses OpenGL, so it's directly to OpenGL. Um, it's not a general purpose vector graphics API. It's not a drop-in replacement for Skia or for Core Graphics or for any of those other or Cairo, any of those other APIs that you might have used. Uh, it's just CSS, and uh, that's because, as I said before, if we tried to be a drop-in replacement for that, we would be limiting our performance. Um, Basically, what we're doing is taking advantage of the fact that CSS has specific properties that are nice for the GPU. Um, retain mode, multi-threaded graphics engine. Uh, it takes a display list and draws it to the screen. So instead of, you know, if you've used APIs like Cairo, you may have seen things like, you know, you create a pen, you draw a path, and then you draw, uh, you know, and you change colors and you change clipping regions and so forth. This is not an API like that. This is actually an API where you give it a post laid out page. You give it positions of everything on the screen all at once, and it looks at the whole thing and optimizes it for uh, better GPU usage. And this is basically how we get our performance wins. Um, so to give you an example of what that is, concretely, here's a little bit of Wikipedia that I just uh, saved. So this is actually the display list that Sorvo generates. Um, and you can see that it has, uh, that it's basically a list of items. You have some, you know, some text, solid colors, images, shadows, um, and, and their positions on the page and the order in which you draw them in. Um, and not shown here, but also clipping regions for them. And they, uh, and so you basically give all of this to uh, WebRender all at once. This is, ac this is actually, pretty much covers everything that WebRender can do. It has about six different items, but those six different items, actually everything in CSS can be described that way. Um, so uh, as for where we are, um, the so this work started about uh, five months ago, I guess, September 22nd. Um, two people, uh, Glenn, who's the in Australia, who's the uh, lead developer, and me. And so we have, Basic, at this point, we basically have implementations of all the CSS that Servo supports, and it actually landed today. Um, good day to be giving this talk. And there's lots of, uh, there's still a lot of bugs. Um, you know, in theory, we're all feature complete, but there are a lot of bugs that we're chasing. We're hopefully going to have it on, um, you know, in, in the next couple of months. Or on by default, so it's behind a switch right now. So uh, what you need to run it. We have OpenGL ES 2.1 and OpenGL 3. Uh, these are pretty, you know, these are pretty old. This pretty much covers everything that that you uh, that you have. This gives us um, these are similar to the minimum requirements that Android has, where so it basically covers every mobile phone. Um, 
So not everyone has OpenGL3 features. Pretty much everyone on desktop does, but not everyone on mobile does. Um, but So we will use them, but we don't require them. Um, the uh, And one question we often get is, what if you don't have a GPU or your GPU drivers are busted? Um, we're not entirely sure, but there may be some way, to, or we may be able to use LLVM pipe or something to run it on the CPU, but we don't really have any plans yet there. That's still kind of a, that's still kind of an open question. Um, so as for web render, I think one of the things that I'm most excited about is that uh, it's actually a separate library from Servo. So even if you're not a browser engine, if you can describe your graphics using CSS, uh, we will be able to render it for you. And um, I think this would be, for example, a really good backend for mobile apps or something like that. Um, if you have an OpenGL context and you have 2D vector graphics that, uh, that are like CSS that you want drawn, we can draw it and we can draw it very quickly. Um, hopefully, as quickly as anything you would handwrite yourself in OpenGL. If uh, that's not the case, then you should maybe file a bug. Um, so how does it work? So uh, this is a little small, I'm sorry. But um, it's basically, we basically have two threads. We have a, um, and the so we have the backend thread, which has A, B, B, tree, tree building, resource building, node compilation, visible node collection, and frame publication. And then we uh, have a compositor thread, which actually does the GPU work, which has texture upload, resource rasterization, and drawing. And I'll go into these uh, in, in more detail. But the basic takeaway here is that there's two threads, one of which gets all of the work nest done on the CPU for the next frame, and, and then pushes everything to the GPU thread, which actually does all the GPU processing. So that actually gives us uh, a nice amount of parallelism and uh, is uh, basically is a, is a nice way to structure these things. Um, and in particular, it allows us to uh, continue drawing frames even if the CPU part is running slow. So the first part of this is uh, an AABP, AABB tree, which is short for Axis Align Bounding Box Tree. Uh, so the first thing we do is we take, all, we take everything on the page, everything that you gave us, and we sort it into a bounding box tree. And the, basically the way this works is um, because things on the page are rec tend to be rectangles, is a really good structure. Um, you basically group things into rectangles and group those rectangles into larger rectangles, um, and you create a tree structure, something like this. And uh, this is a very common technique. Essentially, you know, lots and lots of game engines, for example, do this. Uh, this and this ends up being a really good way uh, to organize your GPU commands uh, and do col and do calling and all the and things that I'll get into later. So. Yes, yes, it, it is a scene graph. So th this is where the display list becomes, uh, it basically be becomes a scene graph. Um, so uh, this is, so each of these nodes would contain the display items that I was talking about earlier. Um, so we start off with a flat list, which is what we get from, uh, from layout. And then we take these lists, these items and place, the first thing we do is we place them into the scene graph. Um, so, uh, so for resource building, uh, we traverse the tree and we find everything that we're going to need. Um, so glyphs, images, paths, and shadows. And we do we rasterize all of those on the GPU right now, um, except for glyphs, which uh, we currently do on the CPU, but I'd love to do, do that on the GPU in the future. Um, we do everything, everything on the CPU, which is the glyphs, we rasterize in parallel. Um, and Rust made it very easy, made it very easy to do this. It was like um, it just went in one day, and it you know took uh, really it just took a few minutes to uh, do that. We're getting a lot of nice wins out of that. Um, and these objects are retained from frame to frame. So we actually one thing to note that we actually handwrite all of our shaders. If you've looked at some of the other uh, some other GPU uh, engines, they often have shader combiners that will dynamically create shaders at runtime. We don't do any of that. We actually handwrite all of our shaders. And that's really nice for optimization. You know, if there's a problem, we can we don't have to write debug code that generates code. We can just debug code. Um, so th that's one of the wins we get by specializing to CSS. We only have a handful of shaders, like six or something. Um, so after that, we build batches for every node uh, in parallel. So this at this step is actually the slowest step. Um, it actually takes a lot more time to act to generate. Usually, it takes more time to generate the commands. Then the, it takes the GPU to execute those commands, which is 
like which really illustrates how fast GPUs are now, nowadays. Um, most things can actually be batched together. Uh, pretty much, in, it's not uncommon for us to render an entire page with complex shadows and stuff in one draw call. Um, and that's because we carefully uh, crafted a shader that basically ha that basically handles everything, and it's actually a pretty simple shader. Um, so if we run out of texture space in an atlas, or we have weird clipping regions that don't often arise on pages, then we may have to break batches. But usually, um, we can submit everything to the GPU in one draw call. Um, and this is just basically going over. Uh, we we find the nodes that are visible, and then we ship those over to the other thread. Um, and on the other thread, then we'll actually do the texture upload. We will do the rasterization command, so we'll switch shaders and uh, do things like draw box shadows, draw text shadows, draw border radii. We have special shaders for all of those. Um, and we group those as much as possible. So if you have 10,000 recs that all have shadows, we won't issue 10,000 draw calls to the GPU. We'll just do one. Um, and we group all resources into texture atlases, and we have the allocation code that manages that, those atlases. Um, so for drawing, uh, when we actually get to drawing, we batch them together. Uh, we try to use one shader as much as possible. Uh, for effects that were, some effects require intermediate surfaces, like opacity, we have to draw to a text, we have to draw to a texture and then blip that texture again for annoying reasons. Um, but we try to do the best we can to batch all this stuff together. Um, so okay, so now for a couple of tricks that we do, um, and this is where it gets kind of interesting because uh, we end up specializing. This is where we kind of specialize the CSS and things that we find on the web. Uh, so one of our tricks is instance drawing, where uh, so we notice on pages the vast majority of things on a page are rectangles. In fact, it's very rare to find something that isn't a rectangle. Um, that it, CSS is defined in terms of boxes, so this is no accident. Um, but and this is not just the CSS specific thing. This is true for most UIs also. You know, most UIs consist of rectangles, axis line. Um, so uh, so this is actually wasteful if we use a full-blown graphics API, which is uh, you know, the normal OpenGL API is designed for drawing you know, meshes, 3D models, things like that, where they're not axis-aligned rectangles. So you end up submitting a whole bunch of vertices, um, which is kind of silly because you're just submitting rectangles. So we realized that we can actually do better with OpenGL 3, which with instance drawing, we can say we can Note that we can basically treat all the rectangles as the same four vertices uh, and submit them again and again and again. And uh, then we replace the, vert the vertex drawing with uh, data about each rectangle. Um, and this is, not, this is not anything new. Games have often uh, had the same observation for particle systems. So we're kind of doing the same things that GPUs are optimized for. Um, so this uh, dovetails nicely with the next trick which is um, we, so, so there are a few observations that really actually hurt GPU rendering of web pages um, in, uh, in basically in other engines. Uh, that's, and one thing that we noticed that was actually uh, often slowing other engines down is that, uh, including our engine before we switched to web render, um, which is that clipping is very expensive. And clipping if, is where, you know, if you have, uh, you know, an object and you want part of it, you want only render it within a certain box, a clip out the rest of the box. Um, there are ways to do this on the GPU with uh, scissors, stencil, you may have heard of these, um, but GPUs don't like to do a lot of those very quickly. They incur a lot of state changes, have a lot of overhead in the driver. Um, and we could do it on the CPU, and we actually did in earlier versions of web render, but that ends up being really slow. Um, in fact, when we did this, we found that the time we spent clipping was actually more than the time than all the rest of the time combined. Um, and it's just because GPUs are so much faster at this than CPUs are. Um, the second observation is that most clipping in CSS is really simple. It's just a box clipped to another box. For example, like consider an image that's partly scrolled off the page. That's the most common clip thing. Well, that's an extremely simple clip. Um, and the third observation is that it's so simple that actually clipping a rectangle to another rectangle always results in zero or one rectangles. Um, so, there is, so we modified this to actually take advantage of a trick where we pass the clip rectangle to the GPU and perform the clipping there in the vertex shader. And vertex shaders have the restriction that you can't create more vertices than you started with, which is why you normally can't do clipping there. 
but we never do because we have a, we're clipping a rectangle to a rectangle, which means that we have the same number of vertices, which means that we can do it in the vertex shader. So, uh, so we actually, so 99 probably percent of, probably upwards of 95% of our clips are done on the GPU in the vertex shader in this way. And that was a huge performance win. Um, and we only have to uh, bail out to the CPU or the stencil buffer when we have weird clips, which don't happen very often. It's, if you had like a div that had overflow hidden, another div inside that had a weird transform on it and overflowed that box, then we'd have to use the stencil buffer. But that pages don't usually do that. That's pretty rare. Um, okay, so now for some demos. Um, so here, so these are some, uh, so first I'm going to show uh, Wikipedia. And, uh, oh, I've got, I've got the debug shader. Um, let, let me go back and fix that. There, there, okay. Uh, thank you, I don't have to recompile. Okay, so here's, uh, here's and there's a little lag because of the, the projector, but, um, so here's Wikipedia with the debug, uh, with the server debug view, and um, you can see that it's very, uh, very smooth and fast, and in fact, it's rendering at um, the GPU time is 0.46 milliseconds, um, which is a lot of frames per second. I think it's something like 500. Um, so GPUs are very, very, very fast. And in fact, if you program them correctly, there is essentially no web page out there that they cannot get through in multiple hundreds of frames per second. Um, so uh, this, this also shows kind of our debugger. Um, we have... Uh, we have a debugger that allows, has some pretty nice features like live shader reload um, that gives us, it allows us to very quickly uh, track down performance problems. So because we're really fast existing web pages, it's actually kind of hard to find a web page that we're um, slow on. So we have some, uh, we have a few benchmarks um, and these are totally artificial bench benchmarks. Um, but, uh, they basically kind of push things to our, to the limit. And here is one of the, uh, here is a pretty uh, benchmark. And this is actually um, entirely done in CSS with divs that have uh, borders. So this is a few hundred divs that have borders that are moving around um, and the background is changing all the time. Uh, and I will not show this in Firefox or other browsers because it's like one frame per second and will freeze my browser. But it is, uh, but it, it's very uh, fast here because we essentially did all of the blitting on the GPU. We cached it all, and in fact, uh, what is it? It's like 1.2 on the CPU and 0.1, so it's about 300 something frames per second, probably at least. Um, and here, here's another demo, um, and this one is much, much slower. Here's a bunch of rotating spheres that are actually uh, all CSS divs using uh, box shadows. I, c I can remove the uh, the stats so you can see it a little better. Um, oh, there's a white line across the middle. Oh well, I was uh, that's a bug we need to fix. But anyway, um, aside from that one pixel, it's it's going at about 60 frames per second, and this is not 60 frames per second elsewhere. Um, and the uh, and it, what's actually what we're actually bottlenecked here on is the CSS restyling, setting the new CSS properties. Uh, necessary to position all of these things absolutely is quite a bit slower than painting all of it. Um, so essentially we've, we've removed painting from the bottleneck uh, uh, in Servo. So, uh, <laughs> so that's what I have. Are there any uh, questions? Sure. Yeah. Uh, I'm not actually sure that doesn't, that may have been an issue with our, that may have either been an issue with our shaper or with our pixel snapping code. That's one of the things we're uh, picking bugs out of right now. Um, pixel snapping is a whole area I didn't get into, but CSS has these tricky pixel snapping rules that are actually kind of not even spec'd and you kind of have to reverse engineer other browsers. Um, and we're still picking bugs out of that in web render. Um, that may have been some of it. It also may have been uh, high DPI issues. So the it may be that uh, it's detecting the high DPI wrong and 
pixel snappings in, in some weird way. But that's, that's basically what that is. Uh, we don't have sub-pixel positioning yet at the moment, which doesn't matter on high DPI, but uh, it can matter in lower resolutions like this. Anything else? Uh, sure. Are techniques that modern web developers are using to speed up performance of their website, is that going to cause backlash, per se, as this type of stuff becomes mature? So I guess, are techniques that people are doing now to make it faster, are they going to bite us later when we have these optimizations? That's a very good question. I don't, uh, so, so uh, the, the question was, uh, are, there, are the techniques that web uh, developers are using now, are they going to uh, cause problems for this new sort of uh, rendering architecture? And they will not cause problems. We can, so in particular, there is, one technique that is uh, very that is often heard as performance advice that is very kind of specialized to existing, uh, you know, normal painting backends, which is animate transforms and opacity. Um, people say don't animate margins, don't animate absolute positioning because that's slow, causes repaints, um, can't be done on the GPU. Well, that advice is kind of obsolete with web render because everything is done on the GPU. We do full repaints on every frame. We don't really have this distinction between things that, that can be done on the GPU and things that can't. Um, I don't think it will hurt us. It, it shouldn't. It shouldn't hurt us. I mean, it's just it's a slightly more annoying way to do the same thing. Like now, absolute positioning is something that's viable as a it should be about the same speed as transforms. Uh, so it's kind of needless developer pain, but uh, it shouldn't hurt us. In, in terms of uh, in terms of ad performance, it shouldn't be a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you said you're you're using a vertex shader to, to do the, the fast clipping. Mm -hmm. um, are are you is that using alpha blending or or, or, or some some other technique? Uh, so okay, so the question was, do we use alpha blending to do the uh, to do the the clipping um, and if, if I understand you right, the um, so for the main clipping where you're just clipping a rectangle to a rectangle, we don't actually need to do any per pixel stuff at all. Okay. All all we do is we compute the new boundaries of the rectangle, and then we take you know things like the vert the texture coordinates, the color coordinates, and by and do bilinear interpolation to figure out the new ones. So it's basically just taking vertex to ver vertex clipping. Gotcha. There is a more complex one, uh, which is rounded rectangles. When you have like rounded borders. Then we actually have to do compute an alpha mask and do that in the fragment shader. Um, but that is, th that's that's not a problem. It just it's a slightly different mechanism. Um, yeah, yeah, I've done the, the alpha mask. And... Yeah, yeah. So I mean, basically, our main our main fragment shader does like has a color texture, a mask texture, and color and uh, a color. And uh, with that, you can pretty much do all the, the clipping that, that you need um, in most cases, unless the only case that's really weird is the one where you have like overflow hidden div with a weird transform inside. Um, but that's pretty rare. So the question is how this interacts with WebGL. Um, and basically, it's the same thing that a compositing window manager would do. So we're using OpenGL, they're using OpenGL. What we do is that, that gets redirected to a texture and we render that texture as part of the scene. It's just kind of an opaque thing that we render as part of the scene. Um, we, we do have WebGL support right now. Um, it's, not, it's not as fast as it could be um, because to make context, to make multiple GL context fast, you kind of have to do like OS specific stuff that we haven't done yet. Um, but there's no reason in principle why it, it, it can't be uh, fast. So it basically becomes like a traditional compositor for the case of WebGL. Uh, and I think Canvas will likely be that way too. Canvas will probably be rendered using Skia GL or something like that and uh, composited into the, web, into the web render scene. Any other questions? Uh, so the question is, how does it compare to Qt Quick or a native UI toolkit? So I don't really know how Qt Quick works. Um, so I don't know. Um, when it comes to native UI toolkits, uh, it kind of depends on the OS. But in general, native UI toolkits are written uh, because they're, they usually predate a GPU compositing. They're usually written to um, ex vector graphics APIs like the, like the ones I mentioned at the beginning that are 
uh, that were started as CPU and then moved to the GPU. So I don't think they – so WebRender is, in principle, um, something that makes better use of the GPU. However, you know, this, this changes quite a bit. iOS is significantly better for the GPU than Coco is, for example. Um, so these things, these things change quite a bit. But overall, uh, I mean, WebRender's pretty – I don't think you're going to be doing – much better than web render it's it's pretty optimal but you know uh the but it, it really depends on the ui toolkit in question i i think that it should be as fast as native i mean or, or faster than native is there been any work on you kind of alluded to it a little bit on taking the, the sort of api with half a dozen primitives that mm-hmm. you have and, and exposing that kind of at a user level for right to write to directly instead of writing css uh, so the question is, uh, has there been any thought about taking uh, our primitives and s- exposing them directly instead of through CSS? And that's that's an interesting idea. I haven't really thought too much about it. We are certainly, I hope that, that, that we don't have to do that because uh, there's a lot of stuff that's basically um, removing the layers of CSS that are needless abstractions right now. Um, so that my hope is that in the future we will actually be able to web web authors will actually not need to have a separate thing they'll just write you know some sort of CSS and it'll just work you know things like uh, so right now actually the bottleneck um, for the the spheres demo was actually is actually parsing the numbers that are in the CSS because you know when you move the sphere you have to uh, set a string which then gets parsed again as CSS that's kind of needless overhead. Um, there's work in Sanders Committee. Uh, Google has done great work on the, uh, pushing things like Type CSS on. Um, hopefully, with that kind of thing, there won't need to be uh, a level of a sort of thing that pierces the veil of CSS because CSS will be such a tiny layer, it won't matter anymore. Um, and to the extent that it's not a tiny layer, I think we should be working on new standards and new specs that help it become a, a, such a small layer that it doesn't matter, matter anymore. Um, I, I, I hope that people will not. I th- CSS is uh, pretty easy to use, and I hope to maintain its ease of use, you know, uh, going forward, while allowing people to get the best performance that they can. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the question is, uh, have we looked into Vulkan? And that's actually great, uh, a great question. We have had Vulkan in the mind from in mind from the beginning. That's part of the reason. That's much of the reason we have the multi-threaded architecture. Um, so the plan, tentatively, is we have all these worker threads that are building batches. Right now, they have to serialize and push everything over to the GPU thread. In the Vulkan world, ideally, um, they would be able to d- directly insert into the command queues, and we wouldn't need that separate thread. All of the node compilers could just insert into the command queue directly, which would eliminate uh, some synchronization overhead. So yeah, w- uh, I'm pretty excited about what Vulkan can bring. Also, less buggy drivers would be wonderful. Um, and Vulkan promises less buggy drivers because they're much smaller. Anything else? Right. Uh, yeah, so the question is, is there more work that we thought about moving to the GPU? And the answer is definitely yes. I, uh, I hope to be talking about some uh, work I've... So uh, I've been doing an image codex. Um, so we're looking at things like image codex. We're looking at font glyph rasterization. I alluded to that earlier. Um, basically, my view is we should take the pipeline starting from the end, the, the, end, you know, the end being the screen, push that into the GPU, and keep pushing backwards in the pipeline until we hit a wall. And I, I, and, and I hope we don't hit that wall pretty soon. So we're looking at things like glyph rasterization and maybe um, you know, getting some of the displayless construction to be on the GPU, things like that. Um, so eventually, hopefully, we'll hit full utilization of the GPU capacity and full utilization of the CPU capacity, and then we'll be running optimally. But there's, I definitely don't want to stop here. I think that there's, there's a lot more that we can continue to do um, with the GPU, and it's going to be increasingly important to do that going forward, given that GPUs are just getting more and more and more powerful, and CPUs have kind of stalled. Anything else? Okay, oh, great, great. Well, uh, thank you, um, and I'll be available for questions afterward if anyone wants to talk. Thanks. Thank you.
Hey there. Uh, so Alan uh, from the internet is up next. Uh, hopefully hey this video will come up. Am I am I on? Yes, we can see you. Yay! All right. Okay. Let's see if I can get my slides up. Um, let's see. Can you see slides? Uh, yes, we can. All right. Can. All right. Okay. Let's see if I can get rid of the annoying Chrome on the slides. Has the Chrome vanished? Yay! No Chrome. Hooray! All right. <laughs> okay. So. Uh, so thanks everybody. Um, uh, so I, I, I drew the short straw, and and I'm talking after Patrick, um, and and Webrender. Um, uh, so I'm going to be talking about uh, streaming parsers in in Rust. So this this came out of um, uh, work wanting to start with some work on WebAssembly. Um, so and part of that is is just the the kind of grunt work of um, of parsing the WebAssembly uh, file format. And so, of course, I, I, I look around and, and look to see what libraries that are out there for, um, for writing parsers. And of course, I, I end up writing my own, because that's, that's pretty much what everybody does when they start looking at parser libraries, um, is end up writing one themselves. Um, so I'll, I'll say a bit about why I ended up doing that, given that there are existing parser libraries out there, and what the, the goals are for, for Parcel, and, and um, where it sits in the design space of, um, of parser libraries. Um, and I'll, I'll show you a little bit of it in action and talk a bit about the implementation. Um, right, okay. so. Goals. So, so most of the interesting work here is actually about what is it that, that uh, we're trying to do differently um, with, with Parcel. Um, and uh, there's, there's four goals that I'll talk about. Um, uh, the first one is uh, par streaming input. So the, the PARS input part is unsurprising. It's, it's the fact that um, we're doing streaming from the get-go. Um, that that's the, the bit that's slightly different here. Um, and we're trying to do this with as, as low a footprint as we possibly can. So um, uh, hopefully, uh, zero memory allocation. So now that, that's inside the library. So the, obviously, there's going to be user code that's doing something like building an abstract syntax tree. And so it's going to be doing its own memory allocation. But it would be nice if the library wasn't doing it. So the, the user had quite tight control over where um, heap allocation was taking place. Um, third goal, um, which you might be a bit, little bit surprised to see up here, but I'll, I'll say why it's an, an issue in a bit, um, is we'd, we'd like to, to be um, uh, doing type inference where possible. So there, there are some uh, types under the hood here, and we'd like them to stay under the hood. Um, so we'd like those just to stay as implementation details and not something that, that ends up polluting the, the user's mind space. Um, and lastly, um, I'd like wherever possible to be doing um, static method calls rather than dynamic method calls. All right, so, so those are the, the, the four goals. Um, and numbers two and four are probably the most important ones. So those are the ones which um, are about efficiency. So they're about minimizing the, the space usage of the generated parser and um, minimizing the, the runtime of the generated parser. Right, OK. So, um, uh, so what does this actually look like? Right, well, so this is, this is um, a, a actual parcel code, getting it to um, parse a little expression language. Um, so from somewhere, we get a parser. Don't really care where yet. Um, and then you feed it some data. So this is kind of like what you would expect to do. Um, so we feed it the string x plus 37 plus y. 
Um, and there's a bit of what, wrapper code you have to write around that because we actually want the iterator off of that. But um, and we then pass the data in, get it back out, and yay, we parse it. Woohoo! Hooray! Lucky us. All right. Okay, that's what a regular parser looks like. Um, the thing that, that makes a difference if you're doing streaming parsing um, is that you're now doing that a chunk at a time. Um, so imagine that you've connected this thing up to some source of data, such as the internet, uh, that feeds you data in packets, um, rather than giving you all of your data at once. Um, and now, suddenly, rather than being given the whole string, x plus x and plus y, um, we're given it in, in, in chunks. Um, right, OK, so this makes a bit of a difference to our lives, because now, suddenly, when we feed the first lot of data to, to the parser, um, it's not finished. It's not done yet. Um, it has to actually continue on. Um, so it, what it gives us back is actually um, a bit of state, um, a bit of saved parser state that we can feed some more data into it. And then eventually, after feeding enough data to this thing, um, yay, right, it succeeded. We actually did get a, a parse object back. Um, and this is a kind of quite useful if you've got streaming sources of data, because um, if you uh, require the, the parser to operate um, on the whole input, then you have to buffer up the whole input. You can't actually start parsing until you've got everything. Um, and that means you're having to copy all the packets as they arrive into some um, uh, byte array. Um, and uh, that copying is quite expensive. Um, so it'd be much cheaper uh, if you could actually parse on the, the data as it arrives. And in particular, like identifiers, like x and y there, um, we'd actually like to be able to use the backing store of the packet that arrived in um, as much as possible and not have to copy into our own owned piece of um, uh, uh, data. Um, so this is kind of annoying. <laughs> right. um, uh, it's a bit of a pain to write these streaming parsers. Um, and indeed, this is kind of why I got into this in the first place, is that um, it's not that bad writing a, a recursive descent parser by hand um, if you're given all the data uh, from the get-go. But if it's arriving in chunks, um, then you're having to deal with saving and restoring parser state, uh, the chunk boundary. So the, the data turns up, uh, the first chunk arrives, and at the end of it, you discover, oh, actually, we're not done yet. We still need to keep going, right? Well, at that point, you need to save your parser state so that when the next chunk arrives, you can restore the parser state um, and carry on going. And you keep needing to do that. Um, so you get this pain of saving and restoring parser state um, in order to reduce the amount of buffering you're doing. So you get a trade-off here uh, between pain um, and uh, space usage. Um, so, the, so I am a parsimonious Scotsman, um, so I don't like the idea of, of using up space if possible. So I, I'd like to, I'm prepared to pay the pain of uh, saving and restoring parts of state um, in order to, to save on memory usage. All right, so goal number two, um, no memory allocation. Right, so like I said, um, I'm cheap when it comes to memory, so I'd like the parser library not to use any heap. Um, so the user code can do what it likes. It's going off and building an abstract syntax tree, probably. So it, most likely, it's going to be allocating memory for on the heap for, for um, AST nodes. But um, I'd like it the library wasn't doing any of that, so that the user has a lot of control over the, the space usage of, of the generated parser. Right, so... Can we do that? Can we get a library that uh, works with uh, zero memory allocation? Um, and the answer, I'm afraid to say, is no. <sighs> Damn. <laughs> right, OK. And so the problem is that there's a, there's a tension here um, between these two goals, um, that 
Um, like I said, um, you've got to save and restore part of their state at chunk boundaries. And so that state's got to go somewhere, um, and it's not fixed size. So, you know, throw the pumping lever at this. Um, you're not doing regular languages anymore, so they're not going to be fixed size state, which means you can't stick this onto the stack. So the stack's only there for fixed, fixed size data, and uh, dynamic size data has to go onto the heap. Uh, right, so <laughs> that means we have to heap allocate. Um, we uh, don't get much choice about that. Right, so uh, funnily enough, given the, the, the clash between these, what we're then going to do is uh, rewrite our goals. So we're not going to just throw the whole thing away. We're going to go, go for something um, that is achievable. And that's that we note that the stack, we can stick, um, we can store data on that, in particular parser state, um, while we're in the middle of a chunk. So we're in the middle of doing some recursive descent pars, we're running down the stack. And so the stack is a perfectly sensible place to keep um, the, the state on until you hit the end of the chunk boundary. And now you have to come back, save your state onto the heap. Um, so that it can be restored next uh, next time a chunk arrives. And so the, the goal, rather than going for zero memory allocation, is to go for zero memory allocation between chunk boundaries. Um, so, uh, so when a chunk arrives, we'll start parsing, and we won't do any heap allocation there. And instead, we'll do heap allocation right at the end when we have to save our state. Um, and now all that heap will get reclaimed at the point where we start parsing again. When the next chunk arrives, um, we're back to, to zero heap, um, using zero heap. And in particular, that means if all your data arrives in one chunk, then you've not done any memory allocation. So if you can arrange for all of the data to arrive in a buffer, then yay, our library actually does what we uh, set out to do in the first place, um, which is zero memory allocation. All right. So that's goals one and two. Goal number three is a bit kind of like mum and apple pie-ish, why am I mentioning this? Right, um, so the, if you're used to playing around with libraries like the, the Rust Iterator library, um, you'll have seen that there is actually some um, fairly complicated types going on there, that every function in the library pretty much um, has its own type. Uh, that it returns. And that type implements some traits, and that trait goes and does the work for you. Um, so if you go and write a parser like foo or else bar and then baz, right, well, its type reflects that structure. So its type is, you know, the outer thing is an and then, and then inside that there's an or else. Um, right. And it would be really painful if the user actually had to see that all the time. Um, so what you'd like is you'd like something like the iter what the iterator library does, which is, yay, type inference, woohoo! Um, uh, so the, the user never actually sees any of that. Um, the, all they see is constructing, um, in this case, a parser, in the case of the iterator library, an iterator. Um, uh, so they construct their, their parser. And under the hood, there's some type shenanigans going on. Um, but the, the user should never actually see that. All right. And I will say in a bit why I mentioned that as being one of the goals. Right. Fourth goal. Okay. So now th this one is slightly easier to motivate, uh, which is that dynamic method calls can be expensive. Um, so they can mess up instruction pipelining and prefetching. And they can mess up the optimizations um, that you hope to get from inlining. So pretty much, if you if you destroy function inlining, then you destroy pretty much every other optimization that can possibly happen. Because almost all optimizers, funnily enough, programmers don't write code that's easily optimized. They tend to write fairly repeatable code. Um, and the the things like constant folding come about because you've got inlining. So the compiler inlines your function. And now suddenly there's some constants in stupid places, like you have variable bindings that are just going straight to constants. And the compiler can now optimize those. So if you don't have inlining, then a lot of other optimizations get thrown out with it. Um, so uh, it would be really nice 
um, if we can inline and we can make sure that that um, uh, all branches are, are static, all, all jumps are static where, where possible. Um, uh, and this will, I mean, this ca could result in, in much higher performance code. So we'd like to do, where possible, we'd like to do static method calls rather than dynamic calls. Uh, fortunately, this lines up quite well with, with Rust. So Rust is quite happy about the idea that um, uh, static method calls are the default and the uh, dynamic method calls are something you have to do occasionally, but they're not most calls. Um, Right, okay, so that's what we'd like, but again, oh, no, tough. <laughs> Life sure is hard. Uh, now, the previous one um, was a no that I was pretty damn sure about. This one is a lot more like, eh, well, as far as I know, you can't do this. Um, and the reason why it contradicts the previous goal. Um, so this is why I was mentioning that, that one of the goals is we'd like to support type inference. Um, is because if we want type inference, then there's a clash um, between that and dynamic method calls. Um, right, so why on earth are these two related? Right, okay, so um, quick recap on, on how static method dispatch works. So, so your code, right, is this dot that, and the compiler um, is type driven about working out what the static dispatch is. So it works out the, the static type. For, for this, um, looks up the trait implementation uh, for the type at compile time, um, and therefore it knows which method is being called. Um, and that's the basis behind the static method dispatch. Um, uh, so, um, yay, right, well, okay, we're, we're all, hang on a moment, um, ah, right, okay. <laughs> Better. Um, right. Okay. So, so, so now, why is why why is this an issue? Right. So, well, imagine me. We're we're writing our expression parser. All right. Well, these things are arbitrarily deep, so you're going to be writing some kind of recursive descent parser for it. Um, so, uh, I'll give you for free that you can do each step one expression. So, right. That that's not a problem. Um, you can write step one. It's the fact that these things are arbitrary deep that's the problem. Um, so imagine that we were given a solution for, for parsing step one expressions. Um, and and this thing is now parameterized on some type P that, that, that is the parser to do when it reaches parentheses. So every time it reaches parentheses, right now this is the point where it needs to do because of percent. So now it calls P. Right, so what we're looking for um, is the fixed point for that. So we're looking for some type that, that will do that arbitrarily deep. Right. So that type won't do, because <laughs> that type's got infinite size. So you can't write infinitely large types. Um, so what we're, we're going to do instead? Right, well, you know, it's got recursive types. So what's the problem? OK. Right, yay, we're good. Yeah, right, OK. So. Um, you just box the thing up. Um, so uh, so now our expression powers are contains a box, um, and that box is going to to use the the depth one expression powers on itself. Yay! Hooray! Right? Okay. Woohoo! Right, we've got recursive powers. We've got static dispatch. Yeah, we're good to go. Oh no, we're not. <laughs> right? Okay. And this is where we hit the clash with goal number three. Right, OK. So do you remember that goal? Users should not have to see complex types. Damn it. <laughs> right, X1 is one of those complex types. So that's the thing we're trying to hide from the user, um, is that those complex types exist. Um, and as far as I know, Rust doesn't have any way of doing type inference here. Um, so. You know, there's various ways you can think of of trying to get the, the compiler to infer that type, and I've not managed to find one. <laughs> so, if we had type inference for super trait type arguments or type inference for associated type definitions, um, then we could do this, <laughs> but uh, we don't. And as far as I can see, um, there are there's no magic bit of rustness that will allow us to actually do that inference. Uh, so it could be wrong. So, so you know, 
any any Rust experts out there, any people on on Rust Lang who'd like to 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 show me wrong, I would be more than happy <laughs> to have that happen. Um, but as far as I know, we can't do that. Um, right, okay. So what do we have instead? Uh, right, what we've got is trait object. Um, so powers are traits. I'm prepared to actually make that user visible because they're not actually that complicated. Um, so, uh, so I'm prepared to make those user visible. Um, and, and now we hit the, the trade-off. All right, trait objects use dynamic dispatch. So this is the place in, in Rust where you get dynamic dispatch is when you've got trait object running around. So now we've got our trade-off, which is, um, as far as I can see with, with current Rust, um, you can either do type inference and hide the complex type that the, the PARs are implementations use, or uh, you can do static method dispatch. <laughs> and those are your, that's your choices. Um, so you can't have your cake and eat it. Right, so again, we're going to revise the goal, move the goal posts so that we can actually choose that. And it's going to be the same revision. So what we're going to do is we're going to set up uh, the parser library such that it's only at chunk boundaries that we're using trait objects. So the, the everything inside a chunk is going to be static method dispatch. Uh, and it's only, again, when you have to save state and restore a state, that's the point where we're going to use trait objects. Um, so again, if you can arrange for all your data to arrive in one go, um, then uh, we don't have any uh, dynamic method dispatch. Uh, everything is, is static with dispatch. All right, so. Uh, sets the revised goals, uh, parsing streaming inputs, no memory allocation between chunk boundaries, inferring complex types, and no dynamic call between uh, chunk boundaries. So that's the bit of the design space that Parcel is hitting. So I'll, I'll uh, briefly say um, uh, uh, what the, how this compares with, the, with a couple of other um, parser generators. Um, so uh, LAR prop. That looks a lot like Yak or Bison or Java CC or any of your other favorite parser generators. Um, uh, but it's kind of geared around all at once parsing rather than start, um, uh, streaming parsing. Um, but it does recognize quite a rich class of languages. Uh, NOM is actually the, the one which is most like the, the work that I've been doing. So it's a parser library which makes heavy use of, of macros. and it can recognize an arbitrary context-free grammar and can do streaming. Uh, so it's taken the opposite view of um, uh, being prepared to do more allocation in order to recognize a richer class of languages. Um, and part of the reason why it could get away with that is because it's using macros. Um, and so it can hide a lot of the use of complex types behind those macros. Um, and so the, the, the place where I am um, is uh, uh, the Parcel Parser Library, um, which doesn't have any macros um, and takes the, the point of view of recognizing a very limited class of languages. So it's just LL1 languages. So only one token look ahead um, in order to make these guarantees about static memory uh, usage, set, uh, sorry, static me method dispatch and zero um, allocation. But it was inspired an awful lot by, by NOM and by the, the Huntmeyer monadic parsing libraries. OK, I think I will actually skip over, um, since I'm, I'm uh, short on time now, the actual gory details, unless you have um, questions about that. Um, and I will just leave you with lessons learned. Um, so these goals are actually achievable, which is something I wasn't entirely sure about when I started out doing this. Um, and uh, the, the good news for the you know, Rust borrow, borrow checker is it really did a good job on catching some fairly subtle bugs that, that I wouldn't have been able to catch with, with regular testing about horrible things about exactly what happens at packet boundaries. So you, your tests would have to exactly happen to hit the right conditions of packet boundaries to, to catch the problem. Um, and uh, the fact that we've got a linear type system enforces some safety properties. 
So, um, like, after you're done, you can't provide any data to the parser after it's been after it's finished. Um, uh, there's an awful lot of issues with lifetime polymorphism that I've hit. So, if Eddie B is around, hello, Eddie. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and there's a couple of traits that would be very useful to have. So I made quite heavy use of these, and there's a question about like, oh, should they be in the, the somewhere like more like the standard library, uh, which is a peakable iterator trait, not just a, a type, and it's a static trait um, that does the same job as to own, only on, on converting things to static. For some particular cow data, it would be very useful to be able to convert that into static and back again. And lastly. This act without fear thing really is true. <laughs> so um, I, I, it was remarkable how confident I could be about just editing, making huge, great edits um, to the, the, the tree and not worry about it too much because if I could get it past the type checker and past the borrow checker, chances are it was going to do the right thing. Um, and comparing this with, with any time I've had to write other code you know, in, in C-like languages, um, where you have to be very, very careful about what you're up to. So, so this was this was quite a, uh, a nice experience. Okay, so thank you very much. So I'm pretty sure you're right that uh, you can't get rid of the. Uh, that you can't use type inference to get rid of the large types at the moment. But the good news is that there are proposals in the work uh, for return type inference, or AKA abstract return type. Um, this is an RFC that's sort of right. coming uh, Yeah, I've got some bad news for you there. <laughs> I, don't in I don't think infiltrates will actually do the job. <laughs> I, I, I actually need type inference in some places where uh, infiltrates won't do it. I mean, obviously, um, <laughs> Infiltrates are still a bit up in the air, <laughs> so yes. I don't really 100% know, but I, at the moment, ooh, I'm afraid to say, so, I think I need something else than just infiltrates. So you mentioned in particular that you thought if, if you got inference for an associated type, that would be enough? Which at least... Oh, yeah, yes. It's, it's uh, on associated type definitions. Yeah. So if you could just write, anywhere where you're, you're, you're writing... A, a, a trait that's got an associated type in it. If you could just write, you know, type output equals underscore and have the compiler work out what that type was, that that would be good enough. So so that's the thing that I'm currently missing. Right. So that so that's actually so Eddie B has implemented that variant of the abstract return type proposal. I mean, be, well, it's getting into the weeds, but be, basically, if you think about what abstract return types look like in traits. They basically come down to associated types and uh, an inference there is sort of like the inference you're talking about. Uh, yeah, yeah, yes. So so associated types by itself, I mean, if, if you're just doing infiltrates, that's, that's, I don't think that's good enough. But if you get something else, like um, type inference on, on associated type definitions, yay. Yeah. That's, that's the thing that I'm missing. Cool. Any other questions? Or questions? I don't see any. All right, thank you, Alan. That was great. And next up, we have Sean uh, to close out our evening. I would just like to say, Infiltrate fixes all of the things. <laughs> oh, that would be so wonderful. All right, so I'm going to be presenting Diesel, which is a ORM and query builder that we released back in November. Uh, first of all, people in the back, can you read this code? All right, good. So my name is Sean Griffin. I'm a committer on the Ruby on Rails project. I'm the maintainer of Active Record, which is the ORM for Ruby on Rails. And I created Diesel, and I host a podcast called The Bike Shed, which if you don't listen to, you should, bikeshed.fm. Um, so. Let's talk about uh, why to use Diesel. Diesel is part of a larger web framework that's currently in the works. And uh, as the ORM guy, I figured I'd start with an ORM and kind of build that as a separate thing. So uh, Diesel came out of 
I don't I don't necessarily like writing code like this. This is a, a, a pretty simple uh, query execution uh, using Rust Postgres. And I prefer to write uh, code that looks a little bit more like this and hides a lot uh, some of the gory details of how we execute the query <coughs> and uh, how we go about deserializing it and just hide that behind a layer of abstraction. Uh, and I'm also leaving out a lot of the boilerplate uh, here that would be normal in both examples, uh, both in this example and in here, uh, the boilerplate for um, mapping the database rows into a struct, uh, which wouldn't necessarily fit on a slide because it's basically the entire struct definition plus some extra stuff. Um, but in diesel, it just looks like this because we we use custom derive and, and uh, procedural macros pretty heavily. Now, uh, one of the questions that I get asked pretty often when I present libraries like this is, why is the diesel equivalent of this SQL query actually better? Um, and there's a lot of reasons, but one of the key points <laughs> that, that sort of the question itself misses is that, well, I have fat fingers, and a SQL string isn't something that we can statically check. And I'm actually not super likely to write this. I'm more likely to write something like this. And there's a lot of reasons uh, why um, this is, uh, the typo in my SQL uh, query is, a signif is significantly worse than a typo in my diesel code. Uh, because one, I'm going to get a, and with this error, I'm going to get a runtime error from the database. And when I get a runtime error, especially those from the databases, because Postgres can be really mean sometimes, right? And so I don't see the error it actually gives me. I see <laughs> something along the lines of this. M my computer and I have a little bit of a troubled relationship at times. So yeah, I, I, I don't like runtime errors, uh, especially in Rust. Because as I'm sure you guys all have seen and felt the pains of, uh, you're not actually going to get the runtime error that's like, here's where you messed up. You're going to get something more along the lines of libcore result line 741. Um, so yeah, uh, basically, one of the goals of Diesel is to improve upon um, the lack of static checking of SQL strings and give something that's a little bit safer, more check to compile time, and basically type safe. And specifically, to be the most type safe ORM ever made. Uh, uh, very, very modest goals. Um, so one, one of the other things that uh, I've, I've learned from maintaining active record over the last couple of years is that it's really important to give your users tools that allows them to abstract over your library in meaningful ways for their application. So abstractability, which I'm pretty sure is a word that I just made up. Uh, so here, here's, an here's an example that, that comes out of crates.io when uh, ported over to diesel. Um, uh, now, I really like this example because it, A, it just demonstrates that we can do more complex stuff. This is not a simple example. It involves uh, subselect. It involves dealing with Postgres intervals, subtracting that from a date. Um, and it uses the EQ any operator, which is a, which is a, specific, a Postgres specific thing. Uh, and compared to the original code, which won't fit nicely on, on a slide, um, it's a bit more terse. It has a lot more static checking, but we can improve upon this code further. Um, a SQL string, right, isn't actually something that you can compose. It's not something that you can take fragments of and, and reason about. Um, so, so for example, one of the first things that we can do here is we can, ta is we can take out that first segment, we can extract that to a function called the latest versions on a crate. That's probably something that we would want to reuse. We've, we've taken out specifically the, the belong, uh, version belonging to crate and ordering by the number in descending order. Um, but we don't have to pull the entire expression out. We can still modify it later. We haven't pulled out that limit five at the end there. Uh, we can still, within reason, we can still modify the query in, in ways that, in meaningful ways. We can't necessarily overwrite things that were there before. That's a feature that Active Record has that I really, really wish we could remove. Um, <laughs> really wish we could remove. Uh, but just to drive home how, how non-composable SQL strings are, I, I, I want to show a little bit of, of what the uh, first section of this code actually looks like in Crates.io right now. Uh, so this is, this is actual code from, from, from the crates.io code base. And um, there's already a function on the crate object, or the crate struct, to get the versions which belong to it. Uh, but this function actually goes and executes the query. Uh, TX there is, is a database co uh, connection. Um, and, and, the co and as a result of that, right, we, we can no longer modify or, or do anything to add additional pieces to it later on. And rather than go in and uh, duplicate that logic, what this code ends up doing is performing all of the sorting in Rust and then also doing the limiting in Rust. 
and I'm not trying to, to rag on this code at all. This is exactly what I would do in the same situation because it's just plain easier uh, than the alternative. But really, it, I think it really goes to drive home. Like when you're, when you're writing your entire application, just dealing with SQL, you end up having very isolated pieces of logic which you can't compose together and that ends up with duplication or doing things outside of the database where they don't belong. Out, outside of the database where they don't belong, they do belong in the database. Just to, um, anyway, so back to our original example, we can still pull some more stuff out. Uh, that now minus 90 days, for example, that's probably a concept that actually has some meaning. That feels a little bit like magic number to me, right? We can give it a name, um, define it somewhere separately from the actual query, so we could pull that into a function called recent. We can go farther if we want to, but, but I'm going to stop here in the interest of time because this is all just sort of to make a point that uh, we're trying to pull, uh, build something that you can actually abstract over and give reasonable concepts in your, in your own problem domain and uh, create pieces that you can compose together in interesting ways. So abstractions are cool. Uh, they're not just something for library authors, though. This is one, this is one thing that, that uh, seems to be a point of contention sometimes is that like abstractions are a thing that people who write libraries do, but in my application code, I don't need to worry about abstractions. And I, I really disagree with that. Like you, you still end up want building your own abstractions on how to reason about your own domain concepts as your, as your code base grows larger and larger in size. And when I'm writing applications, I want to think about my problem domain. I don't want to think about SQL queries. My, my, pro, my application is in Rust. Presumably my problem domain exists in Rust, and I want to continue to think in that world, not SQL. Anyway, so that's, that's enough pitching. Um, uh, let's take a look at how we actually go about doing some of what we do. Uh, so I want to look at how we go about constructing a semi-simple query. We're not going to go into a ton of detail about some of the super specifics, but I want to loosely just go over some of the structure of what, of what goes into just uh, gra grabbing users and filtering where their name is equal to Sean. Um, I would call this method where if I could, but where is a keyword in Rust, so it's filter instead. Uh, so the first thing that we have to do is we have to create types that represent all of the tables and columns in your system. So we use macros for this, uh, and this actually uh, can be generated for you with code gen as well. We have another uh, a procedural macro where you can just pass us a database URL, and then we'll go look at your database schema at compile time and call that table macro for you automatically with all of the tables in your system. Um, which, like, a if you don't like it, cool, don't use it. You can call the table macro directly if you. Don't, if you do like it, well, then you write the one-liner instead. Um, and the table macro ends up generating something like this. Uh, we'll create a module. Inside of that module, we'll create a bunch of structs. All of these structs will have a size of zero, and we'll have one for the table and then one for every single column. Um, there'll be one more, which I forgot to put in here, called star, which you almost never actually use directly. Uh, and then there will be like a ton of boilerplate uh, impuls. We, we actually have a, a, a macros file, and the table macro I'm pretty sure is like two thirds of the file, just because we implement every trait. Um, one of the traits that we're going to implement is called expression. Um, an expression is sort of just a, a, a typed fragment meaning something. Uh, similar, you know, we, we were he was we were talking about the uh, in the parsers talk, right? You have all of the all of those little types that represent each of the individual fragments, and this is sort of the same thing, just in reverse. We're not parsing something; we're creating we're creating the SQL instead. Um, and so, an ex uh, expression just has one associated type, which is the SQL type that it represents. In the case of name, it's a it's a column, which is of type var car. Uh, we also have another trait called selectable expression, which basically says that a uh, expression can be selected from a given source or table. Uh, so for example, we'll implement selectable expression for the users table for user, uh, user's name, but we wouldn't implement it for a column that comes from the posts table. And we use this trait, uh, we have this trait as a constraint all over the place to enforce that you can't write a query where you're selecting a column that doesn't exist in the from clause of that query. Um, now, it, now we have that EQ function that exists on all things that implement expression. Uh, we take anything, uh, any other of type T, where T can be converted to an expression of the same SQL type. Uh, and this is more generic than, than, uh, than you might expect, but that's because, right, I can pass, I can do name by I can pass it a stir, I can also pass it a string, I can pass it another column, or I can pass it, you know, some crazy expression. Uh, any, anything that is an expression or can be converted to an expression, uh, which basically means anything we can serialize to SQL properly. And if you dig deeper, you'll find somewhere down in the depths of, uh, of our uh, types module where we implement things for all of the primitives. 
you'll find a place where we uh, state how you convert a stir to an expression of type var car and of type text, and how we convert a vec of u8 to binary and all, all of those. Um, and you know, these things weren't necessarily always the cleanest internally. Uh, if, if, if you guys follow Diesel at all on Twitter, you might have seen me laughing about um, this where clause that we used to have. Uh, <laughs> In, in, in English, what this one is saying is where, where t is a thing that you can call the filter function on and has a primary key, and where saying the primary key is equal to that second argument is a thing you can pass to the filter function, and the result of that is something that you can call limit on, and the result of that is something that you can deserialize to type u. Um, so yeah, don't, don't worry, that, that it's gone now, uh, but I, I, I would like to think that I've won the award for like I, I don't know if where clause hell is a thing, but I think I invented it. I, I would like to nominate this for the scariest where clause ever written in Rust. Um, anyway, it's a little bit better now. We have so, we have something that replaced it, and it's I mean, it's better. <laughs> it's actually just in chunks. Like now, it's just split into three functions. But uh, so the end result of all of this is safety. Um, uh, memory safety, of course, because it's Rust, but type safety in particular. Uh, we have a, a, a pretty large, I actually am trying to expand it because I've found some gaps, but we have a pretty large compile fail suite, uh, like to actually test that if you write an incorrect query that it fails to compile in the right way. Um, so just as an example, if you try an, in a where clause reference a, a column from another table, that's going to fail to compile. Uh, or if you try and compare a uh, integer column, id here would be an integer, to a string or a column that is of type string, um, that should fail to compile. And the safety actually allows a lot of speed. Uh, because we have so many compile time checks, we're able to eliminate runtime checks that any sane person would have in the code that they would otherwise write. Uh, we can do things like fetch columns by index rather than by name, so we can skip a lot of lookups there. Um, we've got a really cool thing where we actually are able to, this one's still in, the, in progress, but where you can, we can basically use the type ID of the query to go look up the prepared statement name, so we can skip a lot of work that way and become literally faster than a SQL string. Um, so yeah, types are really fucking cool. Uh, and yeah, so if you're interested in checking us out, um, we are on the internet at diesel.rs. I also have stickers. They look like this. Um, just, just pro tip, they, they, go, they go like this with the drop going to, towards the direction of gravity. A, a couple of people have been putting it where the can is up, right side up, and I'm thinking this will become the way that people know who's in the know. <laughs> uh, anyway, and we're also on Twitter at, at Diesel Framework. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, I will take questions if anybody has any. Yeah, I know in um, Scala people have been doing some work. Do you work. actually use a microphone? Sure. I believe in Scala people have been doing some work with flexible record systems for things like so Scala records and Compossible for dealing with things like joins or or projections where you have you know, changing sort of types of the database tables. How do you, how do you deal with that with joins? I guess. Um, so, so uh, the question was, how do we deal with the types changing as a result of joins? Um, selectable expression has a second type parameter, which is defaulted to self SQL type because it has expression as a super trait. Um, but that is actually the type that it is selectable as. So, if it is on the right hand side of a left outer join, it would only implement that for the nullable version of that column. And to my knowledge, that's basically the only time anything anything would ever have its type actually change. Um, so uh, uh, you recently added uh, SQLite support in, in addition to Postgres. Um, how do you uh, uh, how do you think about handling support for like the um, database specific uh, syntax pieces, like in SQLite um, on conflict or in Postgres like returning? Yeah. Uh, do I need to be repeating them, or is that going out to the stream? That's going to the stream. Okay. Cool. Um, so basically, the answer is uh, we don't um, like. So, so SQLite has no returning clause, right? Uh, now, s returning is actually uh, particularly important because uh, with the way our API is built, you would never write returning. It's more just if you need the result of an insert or an update, you call um, get result or get results instead of execute, and then we append the returning clause automatically. And that just doesn't compile if you're, if you're trying to do that on SQLite because there's no equivalent and there's no way for us to do it. Uh, upsert's a little bit harder, and we haven't, just because I'm not necessarily even sure that semantically there's a great way to represent that. Um, uh, 
in a database agnostic way. If there is, we'll do that and we'll just have the AST builder do the right thing depending on the back end. If we can't, then we'll just have the actual functions that you call be nested under the, the PG module or the SQLite module and you'll just end up calling different functions that happen to have the same name. Um, in general, we don't try and decouple you from your back end. Uh, backends do really cool stuff, and if you're decoupled from your backend, you're missing out on a lot of really cool features. So we try to embrace the the backend specificness and um, just make sure and, and just make sure that that we have the the static guarantees in place so that you can't accidentally try to use a feature that's Postgres only on SQLite. Uh, given the recent research on stuff like feral consistent control, are you familiar with that? I'm, I'm sorry. What, uh, what There's a. That? It's basically a research showing that ORMs can kind of you can you by using ORMs you can kind of introduce concurrency issues and transactional issues uh, in your programs and basically breaking con transactional invariance because of the use of ORMs. Um, does Diesel push the bounds on that at all or? Uh, I'm not familiar with that research in particular, so I'm not sure I can necessarily answer that okay. question. Um, let, can I restate? Um, does Diesel do anything different with transactions, or does it help you um, write your application, an application that would need transactions to do it more safely? Uh, we give you full control over transactions. So I guess, no, we don't do, any, we don't do anything to help or hinder you in that case. In your examples, um, like you had that one liner where um, you pull the record, you pull the record definitions out of the database, um, and, and then you showed how you could use macros to, to do the same thing. Um, is there a way to go the other way around, like from Rust code, like it generates your your, your database in, in Postgres or SQLite? Yeah, um, so that, that, that kind of comes down to the question of database migrations, um, which we added support for in 0 0.4, 0 0.3. Um, and our, our support for database migrations are just you give us SQL files. Uh, I'm still on the fence as to whether I want to give a Rust DSL to define, uh, to like actually define database migrations. We can certainly... We don't, we don't do this, but it, there's no reason we couldn't um, generate like the create table statement from the invocation of the table macro. And in fact, that would be very helpful for us in our in our own test suite um, because we, we we do that all the time and we need to create the tables like in the test itself in many cases when they're just little one-off things. Um, as for whether like we want to have broader support for defining and maintaining your schema in Rust rather than SQL, I've been leaning towards no, SQL is the proper language for that, but um, mainly just because that's not something, that's the sort of thing that you tend to run immediately in development mode, and if it fails, it fails very loudly and quickly, and I couldn't give you any faster feedback on that. You do get the revert function for free in a lot of cases, which is uh, which is a nice benefit, but that's the only benefit I've really, I've really seen from just from thinking about it for a long time so i've been leaning towards no for no for any broader rust dsl for for my first database migrations but yeah um to answer your question the original question on the on the table macro there's no reason we couldn't we just don't right now but we probably will because our tests will get a lot cleaner uh can you briefly give an overview of the state of the various database drivers like which ones are supported and how mature and then also there's a lot of efforts to do uh, like native Rust implementations of various database protocols and like which of those you want to loop in or rewrite yourself or use a native library like a C library and that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so right now the databases that are supported are PostgreSQL and SQLite. Um, and we are built on top of libpq and libsqlite directly. Um, I've, I've tried to build on top of um, Rust Postgres and uh, RU SQLite in the past, and uh, just certain ways that, uh, that they're structured made them c conflict with the way that, that Diesel's design works um, pretty heavily. So we ended up just falling back to, to, the, direct, to the C implementations directly. Um, there is uh, somebody working on um, a, a MySQL driver, and there's another person working on a SQL Server driver. Neither of those are going to be part of Diesel proper, but it's very important to me to make sure that third-party creates uh, extensibility is a, is a core tenant of, of what we want to try to accomplish. And that doesn't that that a that just means people who need to be able to write other database adapters that 
aren't part of the core crate and have that just work. Uh, it also means that it needs to be very easy and possible to add things like support for Postgres full text search um, and have that be entirely separate from the diesel proper crate because I'm, it, it's, it's just not going to be a library that, that needs to support absolutely everything that anybody might do, but we want to make it very easy for, to add support for the things that you're missing. Um, so anyway, that's the state of, of the current database drivers. Uh, was there another piece of that that I, that I didn't answer? Okay. Uh, this might be a dumb question, but uh, I guess a classical problem with ORMs and dynamically typed languages is you have a table and a model, which columns do you actually need to load uh, to do work in a given context? I'm wondering whether um, Diesel and Rust's type system give you tools for sort of automatically uh, figuring that out. Um, yeah, so one of the things about our design thus far is it tries to not necessarily assume that your database, uh, that your, that your uh, structs are one-to-one -one with a database table. Um, the, the derived queryable line doesn't actually say, like, it can be queried from a table with the same name. It just says, I can be queried from any query that returns um, data of the right shape. Um, now, we never actually generate select star. We will always explicitly list out the columns that we need. Um, I'm actually working right now on an API that, that, that more intelligently maps that to structs in the case that your struct does entirely come from a single table but doesn't represent all of the data. Um, but one of the things that we do enforce just as a sort of opinionated thing is that you need to use all of the columns that you selected. We don't let you deserialize into something that is a subset of what you selected. That's awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi. I'm not entirely sure how to phrase this as a question. It's kind of just to commiserate and get some attention on the topic. Uh, I'm curious about your experience with trying to build the code generation parts of Diesel and trying to get them working on stable and nightly Rust. Um, because the lack of uh, compiler plugin support in stable, it makes it very difficult to maintain this kind of thing over time. I've worked on a few different libraries. I'm sure anyone that's done any sort of code generation feels this pain. Yeah. Um, so I'm kind of curious what your experience with is with it. And um, if you think the popularity of something like Diesel will help to put attention on how important this is. <laughs> Hi, Eric. <laughs> um, so we, we use cert, uh, or syntax for stable. Um, I mean, the, the core team, I think it's very much on their radar that procedural macros and, uh, and compiler plugins needs to, is a thing that a lot of people want and use. Um, the, one of the things that they've done recently is they are doing a better job of just batching up changes to lib syntax so that instead of having something minor breaking every, everybody using syntax every week, it's now like once a month, every month or two. That helps a lot. Um, I don't know if you have anything else that you want to... Yeah, I know uh, Nick from the, the core team is working on a, a stable uh, implementation for for these uh, procedural macro macros. I think it is probably not going to be stable for quite some time. Uh, he I, says maybe this year. Maybe this year, yeah. So so we do have to live with, with something like Syntex until then, and, and unfortunately it is not as as fun to use as as uh, life will be after we have uh, support in the compiler for it. Um, I am definitely open to ideas if anyone has ideas on, on how to make the uh, this this whole process easier. Um, you know, there are some simple things that I've done in syntax, but there might be better ways, uh, potentially like cargo plugins. Now that we have cargo plugins, that there might be things there <coughs> that we could get rid of, like the build scripts. The implicit or the explicit build script and have some things happen in the background. Um, definitely uh, open for ideas there. Um, and, and one of the other things is uh, for diesel specifically, we're trying we're trying right now to improve the story for if you don't want to use syntax but you do want to use stable. Um, we used to have a better story for that pre zero point one that as code gen came into existence that sort of went away. But it'll roughly look something like copy paste your struct definition into five different macros. It works. That's effectively the information we have, we need on on uh, custom drive. Any other questions? Cool. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, guys. I'll be around. If you'd like a sticker, come talk to me afterwards. All right. On that note, uh, we are wrapped up. Uh, thank you so much. There's still plenty of pizza, so uh, feel free to eat it. Um, and I will see you all in uh, March. Thanks. Thanks for coming. Have a good night.